mechanical quantities at the intersection of matter, space, and time. What are these strange beasts? We are still trying to figure this out. A priori x and y could be real numbers, but we've seen that considering these exponents to be small integers already yields a rich playing field. These mechanical quantities, which we've been calling standard, have been progressively defined in the past few centuries, in order to explain the size of things, large and small, the durations, periods, rates and frequencies, and to understand motion, motions of all kinds. We now know that considering a pair of these mechanical quantities yields a kinematic power law. The prefactor k and the exponent alpha are given directly from the underlying mechanical quantities. They are direct consequences of dimensional analysis, so if we want we can just call them k and alpha, but with indices recalling the mechanical factors upon which they depend. Once we know the mechanical parameters, we can quickly derive how k and alpha depend on it. This connection between pairs of mechanical quantities and power laws is the building block of the relationship between mechanics and kinematics. In the last episode, we took an important step and introduced a third mechanical quantity. We've not yet talked about the case where the three quantities are aligned along a horizontal, a vertical, or a diagonal. We are saving it for later. When the quantities are not aligned, we saw that the three regimes associated with the triangle in the mechanical plane, these three regimes intersect at a single event in the kinematic plane. The coordinates of this space-time point are a direct consequence of dimensional analysis. Once we know the mechanical quantities q1, q2, and q3, we know the location of the event. We saw in the last episode that these events are turning points of the dynamics and they can be used as centers of our system of units. The coordinates of the events can be used as units of space and time far more objective than any combination of meters, feet, seconds, minutes, or any arbitrary units we may choose. Whenever we consider the effects of three non-aligned mechanical quantities, we get three regimes intersecting at the same event, the natural center of the space-time plane. We talked about four of these events in the last episode. There are many more, but the scientific literature also contains a lot of examples where solely two lines intersect. The point of intersection can still be used to define units, but these units are not simply given by the three mechanical quantities. We'll see later in the series that just two lines can intersect when they are regimes with entirely different mechanical quantities. In this context, the point of intersection depends on four rather than three mechanical quantities. This case is not the topic of this video. Our topic today concerns intersections that are defined by a mixture of kinematic and mechanical parameters. One regime is explicitly given in terms of mechanical factors, q1 and q2, but the other is just specified by the value and dimensions of its kinematic prefactor k. We could say that one regime is mechanized, whereas the other isn't yet. The pseudo-event resulting from this kind of intersection conserves some of the properties of the event we talked about in the last episode, but its mechanical description is incomplete. By using pseudo-events like this, we are missing out on the full potential of the mechanical outlook on kinematics. We are undecided, afraid to dig a bit deeper and reveal a third mechanical quantity hiding behind its kinematic disguise. These pseudo-events, mixtures of kinematics and mechanics, are relics of history, often consequence of the mistaken assumption that some kinematic quantities are unfactorizable, that they cannot be factorized into mechanical factors. This belief is particularly strong for geometric quantities, as we will see. We've talked about power laws for some time now, in particular about those concerning space and time, a representation of kinematics from what we've called the canonical perspective. We've talked for hours about these power laws and their mechanical underpinning, and yet we've managed to mention the term self-similar only once, in passing in episode 5. It's now time to talk more precisely about what these self-similarities are. We dispense from using the term up to this point because we did not need it, and we actually won't need it either for the rest of this series, but this concept has had such an important place in the development of dimensional analysis in the second half of the 20th century that it would almost be a sacrilege not to talk about it. 
The term cell similar emerged in the study of fractals, geometrical objects that are similar to part of them cells. These kinds of objects were first studied systematically by the mathematicians Benoit Monelbro. They are fascinating structures on their own, independently of the many applications they found in science, particularly in physics. Introduced in the 1960s, fractal became very popular and even entered popular culture in parallel to the development of personal computers, which allows the generation of beautiful images like this one. Ignored for centuries when they finally broke through, the hopes that these objects would revolutionize science were high. They've become instrumental in many fields, but the bubble significantly deflated since the 1990s, as illustrated in this plot showing the frequency of occurrence of the world fractal in the many, many books referenced by Google. Unsurprisingly, the word self-similar had a similar fate. It is less frequent, so we had to rescale the frequency axis, but the trend is the same. The adjective self-similar is usually associated with fractals, so what does it have to do with the parallels we've been dealing with anyway? Because whether we zoom in or zoom out, the curve looks the same. It has no characteristic scale. For instance, if what we are seeing here is the kinematic plane from the canonical perspective, then the dynamics at very small length scales and short times are identical to the dynamics at long time and large length scales. This apparent scale invariance of a single regime can be illustrated by looking at how the value of the prefactor, k, depends on the choice of units. In the absence of any event, the choice of unit is arbitrary. For instance, let's say the power law corresponds to the dynamics of Trinity. We can measure distances in meters and times in seconds, in which case the prefactor k is 583 meters per second to the power 2 over 5. This plot makes it look like that we are solely dealing with a self-similar power law, but this is incorrect. There is actually a point in hiding, an artificial event, the locus of our arbitrary units. For convenience, so that they do not overlap with the data, the axes of a plot like this are usually pushed to the side, but they are really centered at the point of coordinate 1 and 1, that is, of logs 0, 0. With this arbitrary center, with these anthropocentric units of meters and seconds, the prefactor k is 583. If we change the units, then the value of k naturally changes. And if we select units that are on the path of the explosion, then the value of k becomes 1. We can move up and down the curve and the prefactor remains 1. Which is to say that we can always write the regime in this form, where di and ti are the coordinates of any point along the trajectory of the explosion in space-time. In the context of parallels, this is self-similarity. So the units are arbitrary, but some choices on the line yield a simpler expression for the prefactor. The simplest, in fact, since 1 is the sole number that we can and actually do dispense from writing. The usage of the word self-similar in the context of scaling was popularized by a figure who had a great influence on the understanding and practice of dimensional analysis in the second half of the 20th century. Grigory Barenblatt a student of Kolmogorov and later G.I. Taylor Professor of Fluid Mechanics in Cambridge and Professor at Berkeley. His books like Scaling, Self-Similarity, and Intermediate Asymptotics, published at the end of the 70s, or later Scaling, in the early 2000s, these books shaped the modern understanding of these methods, and our own. However, one of the reasons for these videos is that we felt they were things to be added or appended to these seminal books. For instance, you will not find this table in Barnblatt's book, nor what it entails for the relationship between mechanics and kinematics. In particular, the events that we introduced in the last episode, and which are about to take such a central role, are scarcely mentioned in Barnblatt's books. The fascination about the self-similar character of a single regime quickly fades when we acknowledge the existence of mechanical players outside the initial pair leading to intersections, which are much more legitimate as centers of our systems of units. Because if there are indeed an infinity of units simplifying the expression of one regime, there is only one where two intersecting regimes 
have disappearing perfectors, meaning perfectors of 1. The crossover in the dynamics restrict the initial self-similarity. In a sense, the framework of intermediate asymptotics discussed by Barenblatt is connected to this, and the viewers familiar with this topic will be able to judge what our presentation owes to it and how we depart from it. The central point is that whenever two parallels intersect, the point of intersection can be used as an intermediary in the description of the laws on either side of it. We will now illustrate this on a couple of examples, which display two connected attitudes toward the natural world, reductionism and anachronism. The first tendency is widespread in science. It consists in reducing complex phenomena in terms of simple or fundamental constituents. In particular, it is associated with the expression of large-scale dynamics, using the dynamics found at small scale. The second tendency, well, we kind of just made it up, but it seems as important and useful, and it is the temporal corollary of the first. Here, early dynamics are justified by later developments. Both of these tendencies are perfectly allowed in the framework we've been developing in this series. Whether they should be encouraged is another question one we will start to address in this episode and encourage you to think about. A crystal of potassium permanganate is placed in a petri dish of water, and a slow diffusion is tracked by time-lapse photography. For an ideal diffusion process, the area of the patch grows linearly with time, so it means radius grows like a square root of time. The dimensions of the prefactor k are l t minus one half. To avoid a fractional exponent, one usually defines k as the square root of a diffusion coefficient, d, with dimensions l square t minus 1. The coefficient of diffusion, or diffusivity, is a kinematic parameter. We've set it here at 10 to the minus 9 meters square per second, which is also equal to 3.6 millimeters square per hour. This value is typical for molecular solute in water. For diffusion in solids, the diffusivity is much smaller and it is much larger in gases. Like any power law, this diffusive law is self-similar, seemingly extending to arbitrary large and small scales. But of course, this behavior will not extend forever. For instance, at small scales, the emergent behavior of diffusion will have to be reconciled with the dynamics of molecules. There, the cover distance increases linearly according to the average speed c of the molecules typically a few hundred meters per second in gases like air. At small scales, motion is said to be ballistic. Distances grow linearly with time. Whereas at large scale, the dynamics are diffusive. Even without any knowledge of the mechanics underlying these two kinematic parallels, their intersection provides ways to express one from the other, using the coordinates of the point of intersection as intermediary. This can be done in a few different ways, in particular by using the length scale L of the intersection, which in this context was historically called the mean free path. Below this length, the molecules travel in straight lines at constant speed, until they encounter neighboring molecules, and above, the diffusive behavior emerges from collisions between these molecules. This picture is of course quite simplified, but it is good enough for our purpose here which is to show that the speed of the first regime and the mean free path can then be used to define the diffusivity. We invite you to re-derive this equation yourself by equating both regimes at the intersection. This formula incites us to see the characteristic of the second regime at large scale as emerging from the characteristic of the first regime at small scale as mediated by the crossover. This so-called kinetic approach to diffusion has had a great influence, and it helps solidify the foundations of diffusive processes at the beginning of the 20th century. It is a famous instance of reductionism, while the large is explained from the small. Note, however, that this equation can be read the other way around, although this presentation is much less frequent. There, the macroscopic speed c of the molecules is explained from the diffusivity at large scale. The large explains the small. The kinematic parameter of the large-scale regime can be expressed from the small-scale regime, or vice versa. A so-called mesoscopic intersection provides an intermediary between macroscopic and microscopic scales. 
the fact that we rather tend to explain the large from the small, and not the other way around, seems largely cultural at this point. Reductionism is usually welcome in science, because in a context like this one, explaining the large from the small also means explaining the late from the early, the future from the past, an attitude that is in line with the causality that we usually cling to. But should we? Let's go back to Trinity, and let's investigate what is going on beyond the range studied by Taylor. As discussed in the explosion series, if we track the front of the explosion, beyond the time range studied by Taylor, there the speed of the shock decreases to be almost indistinguishable from a sound wave, with a constant speed given by the ratio of ambient pressure and density. Taylor's regime corresponds to the energy-density pair, the sound propagation corresponds to pressure and density, and the radius where the damages from the blast are mostly contained, or final blast radius, is given by the ratio of energy and pressure, a formula we've seen in episode 2, the simple length associated with energy and pressure. We have three regimes intersecting at a single point, an example of an event just like the ones we've talked about in the last episode, depending on a trio of mechanical quantities. Now, just as in the last episode, we can obtain the coordinates of the point of intersection. With this fully mechanical model of the kinematics, the point of intersection and the regimes are expressed solely from constant parameters existing regardless of the scale, but more or less preponderant depending on the successive phases of the dynamics. Let's now consider that we do not have such mechanical insights. Let's say that we only know that Taylor's regime is a parallel of exponent 2 over 5 characterized by a constant explosivity associated with a constant kinematic parameter, k. We also know that the lead dynamics are given by the speed of sound. The horizontal line is not a regime anymore, it just gives the size of the intersection, and we could also recall the time. Now, even with this partial model, we can still equate both power laws at the intersection. We can then express k from l and tau, and tau from L and the mechanical ratio. Combining these two equations, we can express K from L and the mechanical ratio. This expression is absolutely correct, but it is dangerously misleading. Using the size of the intersection as an intermediary, we've expressed Taylor's regime from the pressure and density of the ambient medium. Again, the formula is correct, but because it depends on a geometric parameter L, and not just on two mechanical parameters, we cannot interpret the mechanical factors in terms of impelling and impeding influences. It would be wrong to say that the pressure sigma is driving the dynamics, because in fact we know this regime to be independent of the pressure, since the cube of the size L is actually the ratio of energy and pressure. We can spot this in this case because we know the full mechanical model, but if we only had this partial picture, our interpretation could be easily misled. Due to our lack of knowledge concerning the actual mechanical underpinning of Taylor's model, we are succumbing to the temptation of anachronism. We are expressing the past from the future. Initially, the blast is just a few dozen meters wide, and yet we are expressing it from a length scale L that is much bigger, around a kilometer. With this mechanically incomplete attitude on the dynamics, what goes on around one microsecond depends on the much later propagation of sound. Let us say it one more time. This mixed formula is correct. It is quantitatively correct, but qualitatively deceptive. It is fundamentally different from the fully mechanical model. The first equation depends on three parameters, two mechanical and one geometric, so it seems to be giving more information, but it is actually incomplete when compared to the second equation. The second equation has a smaller number of parameters, and this parsimony is the key to its completeness. In the parlance of Baron Blatt, the second equation is a self-similar solution of the first kind, whereas the first equation is a self-similar solution of the second kind. Note that self-similar solutions of the second kind 
also include cases where the exponent is irrational, a case we'll deal with later in the series. So borrowing an expression from Van Dyck, who prefaced some and reviewed most of Baron Blass books, we may say that the first equation is a self-similar solution of the one and a half kind, and reserve the proper second kind for later. In contrast to the second equation, the first is not directly given by dimensional analysis. If we know the two mechanical factors, energy and density, then the second scaling is a direct consequence of dimensional analysis, a notation we are used to now. In contrast, considering the pair of pressure and density certainly does not imply the first scaling. Even if we add the geometric parameter L, dimensional analysis does not give the solution. Let's see this explicitly. We assume the distance d depends on time and three parameters, two mechanical and one geometric. Filling in the dimensions and grouping them together, we get three equations, but we have four unknowns. We can express all exponents from alpha, the time exponent, but not more than this. Dimensional analysis only gives us a partial scaling. If we plug in alpha equals 2 over 5, we recover the incomplete scaling we started with. But if we don't know that, we can rearrange a bit, and since the left-hand side is a dimensionless ratio of sizes, the right-hand side must also be dimensionless, which is defining a time tau depending on the three parameters. Really, the only thing we are saying here is that the regime we are looking for goes through the point of coordinates L and tau. And you can easily check that the formula for tau just stands for the time coordinates of the point of size L that is on the sound propagation regime. So this formula does not say more than we already knew, that there is a point where the two regimes intersect. Since we do not know the exponent alpha, we do not know the slope of the missing regime. Although both of these formulas are valid, we should always strive to remove spurious geometric factors like L here and express the prefactors of power laws as ratios of pairs of mechanical quantities, as we have done since the beginning of this series. This is what we mean by understanding a power law. When a power law is written as a scaling with more than two mechanical quantities, or even without any mechanical parameter, then it escapes dimensional analysis and leads to all sorts of tricky philosophical positions. Let's try to summarize. When two power laws intersect, the kinematics of one can be used to describe the kinematics of the other, using the intersection as intermediary. This possibility underlines culturally respectable practices, like reductionism, where what is happening at large scale is explained by what happened at small scale. Whether the small-scale dynamics have a higher or smaller exponent does not matter. But as we have seen in the case of delayed explosions, the procedure to express one from the other works both ways. If we allow the small scales to explain the large ones, we must also accept the converse. We must accept that what's going on after a minute influences what happened for the first millisecond. Anachronism is the corollary of reductionism. As we will see shortly, intersections even allow one regime to be expressed from a different one running in parallel. Feel free to name this tendency any way you like. Basically, as soon as two parallels intersect, what happens on one can be expressed from what happens on the other. But these approaches fall short of a fully mechanical model of the kinematics. Mesmerized by the possibilities offered by the intersections, we forget that where two lines intersect, a third one is often hiding. The mechanical underpinning of this third line allows us to get rid of the one and a half self-similar solutions, to cure incomplete scalings, to turn pseudo-events into proper events. Basically, a complete mechanical understanding of kinematics, a proper mechanization of the dynamics, should do away with any purely kinematic parameter any time scale, any speed, and particularly any length scale, like the mean free path or the final blast radius. All kinematic parameters must be decomposed into mechanical factors. On multiple occasions, we've talked about the pinching of liquids, in particular water. The radius of the neck grows as a parallel with the duration before pinch-off. 
we saw that this scaling was due to the interplay of surface tension and density. In the last episode, we talked about the change in the dynamics occurring at short time scales, where viscosity comes into play, leading to the untorque point, an example of proper event. Something we did not talk about is what is going on on large scales, long enough before pinch off. There, the size of the neck is limited by the size of the nozzle from which the fluid is dripping. Let's call the radius of the nozzle L. In this pinching configuration, the radius can get larger than L. This geometric parameter is set by the experimenter. Its value is what it is. From what we know of the inertial capillary regime, we can derive the characteristic time of the intersection. You may recognize the relay time from episode 3. It is the duration of pinching. Then we also called it the hook relay time, because we can express it from the mass m of the drop. And the time scale looks like the period of a mass and spring system, surface tension and stiffness having the same dimensions. Written in this way, this time comes from a pair of mechanical quantities. It is a regime in its own right. We have surface tension, density and mass. And in this model, the nozzle size L is also the initial drop size, so it is a regime too. It is a simple length corresponding to the pair mass and density. The pseudo-event has been turned into a proper event, depending on three mechanical quantities. The mass M, the density rho, and the surface tension gamma. This mechanical model is fine, but it is a bit cheap. We haven't really learned anything here. To reach a deeper understanding of this event, we have to drop the mass and look for something else, another mechanical quantity. There are many possibilities. So far, we've mostly been dealing with situations where the mechanical parameters were known and the kinematics derived from it. For a given pair, we get a single parallel. We mentioned a few times that the converse is not true. For a given regime, there are actually multiple possible pairs. We're not yet ready to dive into this asymmetry, but the procedure to turn pseudo-events to proper events is connected to this. When multiple regimes are involved, the mechanics behind a given parallel are constrained by the other ones, and the other parallels are informed by the type of experimental observations we want to encompass. Here, we certainly want the inertial capillary regime, and probably the constant size of the nozzle, but there is more. It is true that a lot of pinching, coalescing, and spreading droplets exhibit the two-third parallel of the surface tension and density pair. But in seemingly similar circumstances, some drops and bubbles display a markedly different scaling. For instance here, the new dataset corresponds to the pinching of an air bubble. In this context, the density is that of the outer fluid, water. So it is the same as for the blue set of data. The surface tension is also identical, and the size of the bubble is the same as the size of the drop in the blue set. Yet, the dynamics and the geometry of the neck are quite different. For the drop, the radius scales as time to the power of two-third, for the bubble, as a square root of time. Because this regime also goes through the same point, we can naturally express it in the units associated with this point. Then, Using the expression of the relative time tau, we can give the new scaling from the surface tension, the density, and the size L, the nozzle or drop size. This mechanically incomplete scaling dates back to Rayleigh, and we'll tend to call it Rayleigh's regime. You can rederive the formula on your own, it just takes a couple of lines of algebra, and the procedure is basically the same as the one we followed to get this formula, in the case of explosions. The first formula provides a cautionary tale for the second. For explosions, we've seen that we would be mistaken to think of the pressure sigma as driving the dynamics. Similarly, it would be incorrect to think of the surface tension as the driver of the second equation. As long as we are dragging a geometric parameter, L, we cannot clearly identify the impelling and impeding factors. And just as with the first equation, the second equation cannot be derived directly from dimensional analysis. This is usually interpreted as a limitation of the method of dimensional analysis, but it only reveals our own shortcomings, or inability to identify the missing mechanical quantity. Why should the two-third regime be expressed simply from a pair of mechanical quantities, 
and not the other regime. Maybe out of reverence for Lord Rayleigh, we dragged this formulation for over a century, being misled to think that this regime was a more complicated form of inertial capillary regime, dooming scaling methods. It's not that we can't find a purely mechanical formulation of this regime. There are actually many. We just can't seem to decide which one we should adopt. Can we write this scaling law from just two mechanical quantities? Of course we can. Since we know we're looking for a diffusive scaling, we know the two quantities must be on a diagonal of slope minus one half. Like these two, or these two, or these two. We have a lot of possibilities. In this particular case, the simplest choice seems to be the most fruitful. Keep density as an impeding factor. The second mechanical quantity is impelling, so it must be on the right. The regime is growing, and growing as a square root, so there are only a couple of candidates on the table. Density and viscosity would give the boundary layer scaling, and we know this one intersects the inertial capillary regime somewhere else at the onsort point. So we're left with density and force. A regime we talked about briefly in episode 5, promising to return to it in the future. Well, the future is now. If we compare this purely mechanical scaling with the mixed scaling we started with, we see what the driving force is now. It is an actual force. The identification is clear. The driving force F is equal to the surface tension multiplied by the size of the drop or bubble L. F can be called the capillary force on the drop or bubble or the Laplace force, an old force making a comeback in these modern developments. Note that in a fully mechanical model of pinching, coalescing, and spreading kinematics, it's not really the force that we should understand as defined from the surface tension and from the size L. We should rather see the size L as a simple length, a regime based on a force and a surface tension. Together with a third regime combining surface tension and density, we now have a trio of mechanical quantities, and a fruitful trio. When we considered mass as the third quantity, we got a fully mechanical event. We had the inertial capillary regime, the drop or nozzle size, which gave us a regime for the behavior of the size d at long time, but the third regime was a bit wasted. By using the force as the third quantity, we keep the inertial capillary regime and the constant length, but the third regime is put to good use to understand Rayleigh's regime. The event is now understood as emerging from a density, a surface tension, and a force. Using this fully mechanical model of the event to design objective units, a number of experiments with different values of force, surface tension, and density, and displaying the one-half or the two-third regimes, can be overlapped neatly. You can find details on this scaling in our recent review. The essential is that once the mechanics of the event are properly identified, then the horizontal line, Rayleigh's regimes, and the inertial capillary regime are understood on equal footing. Each corresponds to a pair from the trio of the event. We've turned a pseudo-event into a proper event, with fully mechanical coordinates. What's even better is that once we've identified a force as a mechanical parameter in its own right, we can then wonder about its effects on fluids that are viscous rather than inertial. We know the event at the intersection of force, surface tension, and density. And we can now wonder about a similar case, where density is replaced by viscosity. We get the same simple length, the drop bubble or nozzle size. We have the viscocapillary regime at constant speed, which we know well, and we have the force and viscosity regime. We mentioned this one in episode 6. Force and viscosity are separated by two columns and one line. So the scaling is again diffusive, the size growing as a square root of time. Of course, since the drop or bubble size L is the simple length built from the surface tension and the force, we can relapse into old habits and write the force and viscosity regime from the surface tension, the viscosity, and the size L. But we know that this is not a good idea. Written in this mechanically incomplete form, the regime is not a direct consequence of dimensional analysis we are being guilty of anachronism again, when using the large-scale L, which is only attained in the future. We are sanctifying the surface tension beyond its actual reach. In this form, mixing kinematic and mechanical parameters, 
This regime has been seen to govern some coalescence of droplets or bubbles embedded in a much more viscous fluid. In this context, the viscosity is that of the other fluid. For instance, these datasets correspond to air bubbles in silicon oils with increasing values of viscosity. In all these experiments, the density and surface tension remain relatively constant. All these curves exhibit a diffusive scaling, where the radius grows like a square root of time. This is in contrast to the linear behavior observed for a lot of pinching, coalescence, and spreading experiments, which we discussed at the end of episode 8. Unsurprisingly, with these subjective units of meters and seconds, all these experiments are hard to interpret, even more so if we add the long-term kinematics, when the size d approaches the maximum drop size. It's pretty messy, but if we use the objective units of the trio of force, surface tension, and viscosity, the picture becomes much clearer. We have the force and surface tension pair giving us the drop or nozzle size, the surface tension and viscosity pair giving us the linear regime, and the force and viscosity pair giving us the diffusive regime. All three regimes are on equal footing, and their point of intersection has fully mechanical coordinates. We have a proper event. There are still some unanswered questions, of course. What is going on in the vicinity of the event? What is going on far away from it? What tells us if we are to expect the dynamics to be on one regime or the other in parallel? We'll get to these questions later in this series. The take-home message for today concerns what we've gained by revealing a third mechanical quantity, hidden behind the pseudo-event we started with. Then, only a single regime was expressed fully mechanically. The maximum size L was a geometric parameter with no apparent mechanical underpinning, and the third regime could only be expressed in a mechanically incomplete way, piggybacking on the impaling and impeding factors of the first regime, as mediated by the intersection, incapable of being derived fully by dimensional analysis. Well, until three mechanical quantities are explicitly revealed, then there is no more favoritism. All pairs and their associated regimes have equal status and are direct consequences of dimensional analysis. When two parallels intersect, we can always understand one from the other through the coordinates of the intersection. But if we cling to this kinematic reasoning, we miss out on the opportunities of mechanics. Assuming one of the regimes is expressed mechanically, then if the other regime shares one of the mechanical factor with the first, shares either the impaling or impeding factor, then this necessarily means that a third mechanical quantity is involved, and so we get an additional regime for free, which offers opportunities to unify our understanding of three different kinds of dynamics. We got three regimes for the price of two. In a fully mechanical understanding of kinematics, the only valid reasons behind motion are the mechanical quantities, and very often the standard ones found on this table. However, the scientific literature is still littered by mixed models and pseudo-events, for which the mechanization is still incomplete, which lend themselves to endless philosophical debates about what is really driving or resisting, how past and future are connected, or how the small and the large are linked. These disputes fade away once kinematics are motivated by mechanics alone, when the only parameters are scale and time invariant mechanical quantities. In every field where this mechanization has not been completed, the rewards await, ripe for the taking. In the next episode, we will focus on one particular example of great historical significance, the connection between free falls and orbital motions, initiated by Newton, but left incomplete.